Elizabeth I becomes queen in the year 1558. She's the daughter of Anne Boleyn, the second wife of Henry VIII, the woman for whom Henry VIII had his marriage to Catherine of Aragon annulled. And so we have this rising now of the third child of Henry to be a monarch over England. She has the longest lasting reign of all of the Tudor monarchs, ending in the year 1603. And it's her actions that really put a stamp on the Protestant identity of the Church of England and of England as a whole. So in this video, I want to review how she makes this country Protestant. This begins with a series of royal actions that she undertakes um, soon after coming to the throne. Uh, prominent here is the Supremacy Act of 1559. Here she repeals uh, heresy statutes that uh, Queen Mary had uh, enshrined that had essentially made it illegal to be Protestant in England. She also repeals the institution of the Roman Mass as the normative and only legal form of worship in England. Instead, she begins to replace that with the Book of Common Prayer, which we'll get to in a minute. She, in this act, she also reinstates royal supremacy, that the monarch is the head of the Church of England in temporal affairs. And she takes an oath uh, for herself that she also makes others take that affirms that Elizabeth is the supreme governor of the Church of England. You might notice there's a slight change in phrasing here. Henry VIII had described himself as supreme head of the Church of England. She changes this to governor because her argument, and the argument of many um, reformed English people, was that only Christ could be the true head of the Church. She also passes in 1559 an act for the uniformity of common prayer and divine service. This is passed through Parliament. This reinstitutes um, the order of prayer for the Church of England according to the Book of Common Prayer of 1552. So what she does is she doesn't um, commission a new prayer book. Rather, the 1559 prayer book is essentially just a uh, readmission uh, into authoritative status for the older prayer book. This act for uniformity also punishes those who would speak out against these services, um, uh, punish people who threaten ministers for performing these services, or for people um, who are absent from the services. So you couldn't simply opt out of going to church. If you didn't go to church, you would be fined. Getting the Book of Common Prayer passed through Parliament required some uh, concessions. One was that the words of administration of the Eucharist are altered to allow for an understanding of real presence. Um, this is to help ease not simply Catholic ideas about the Eucharist, but also those who held Lutheran ideas over against the majority of people uh, who are supporting Elizabeth, who hold reformed or memorialist ideals. Uh, this prayer book also retains the use of, of vestments and some ornaments of the Mass, um, but is reformed in its doctrine of the Eucharist. That is, um, it's not that copes and chasubles are there or that we have monstrances on the altar all these very catholic things but simply that um the cassock and surplus is worn the uh, surplus was uh the white garment over the black cassock and the surplus was associated uh as a eucharistic garb that uh, roman catholic priests wore and so the surplus is a, is a symbol of the possibility of a uh, that someone might think that a sacrifice of the Mass is happening here, and that is a bit controversial. We'll get into that more later. But if you read through the 1559 Book of Common Prayer, its theology is thoroughly reformed, as we had seen in the 1552 book. 
One of the things to really understand about the era of Elizabeth is that throughout this, there's huge debate among Protestants in England about how reformed the church should be and um, what the purpose of uh, Reformation is. Uh, and this is really sometimes uh, hard for us to conceptualize because we have this whole notion of a Elizabethan settlement that somehow Elizabeth came to the throne and settled all the disputes. This is really not true. Um, Elizabeth wants uniformity in worship. Uh, she wants people to like say the words and go to church and not cause trouble. But because she never settles the debate over how reformed the church should be, that actually leads to lots of experimentation on the ground and the emergence of different schools of Protestant thinking. And this then means there's actually quite a bit of religious, religious pluralism within the Protestant orbit of England. It's only in the post-Civil War era, that is after the 1660s, essentially two generations later, three generations, that the Elizabethan era retrospectively is recast as an era that ensured the stability and uniformity of the church. That is because the Church of England in the late 17th century is looking for uniformity and stability. It also reads it onto what happens under Elizabeth. I hope we can unpack that a little bit more in class and as we continue to look at this material. Along with the Book of Common Prayer as a symbol then of uniformity, the 39 Articles, passed in 1563 and then revised in the 1570s, um, is another key symbol of the work that Elizabeth does. The 39 Articles are produced by uh, Queen Elizabeth's Archbishop of Canterbury, uh, Archbishop Parker, who himself is a protege of Thomas Cramer. It has within it some Lutheran and a lot of Reformed Protestant views that the exiles who returned from Europe uh, after Mary dies uh, bring with them. If you compare the 39 Articles to other Protestant confessions of faith written during this time period, uh, you'll find that it's not as detailed theologically as some of those other ones. So one of the ways we could describe the 39 Articles then is that it has a minimalist theology, that is, it says the, the least amount, in order to gain broad uniformity and maximum adherence to a Reformed Protestant theological perspective. That is, the 39 Articles essentially want to be reformed in their theology, but they uh, generalize the claims enough that multiple people can affirm them so they can be a source of uniformity and unity uh, during the reign of Queen Elizabeth and going forward. Uh, these articles are uh, useful to know in an Anglican context. They are a frequent point of reference. Uh, so I just want to highlight uh, a few of them. One is Article 11, which teaches that uh, righteousness by uh, justification by faith uh, and the merits of Christ is what affects salvation, that works don't. And so Article 11 is really just a very broadly uh, Protestant statement, uh, both a Lutheran and a Reformed and indeed even probably Anabaptist, could affirm this. Likewise, Article 12 teaches that good works follow from justification, but they cannot save one or help one earn forgiveness. Likewise, this is very broadly Protestant. You'll note Article 25 teaches on the sacraments, uh, which they define as being two, just like all other Protestants in this time are, the Eucharist and baptism. And they are uh, defined this way, in Article 25 as, quote, sure witnesses and effectual signs of grace and God's goodwill to strengthen and quicken 
end quote. So this article on sacraments has a sacramental theology that's very much in line with John Calvin's sacramental theology. So we read this and we say, oh, sacraments are um, effectual signs of grace. And we can read that as like, oh, that's like a contemporary Anglican definition of sacraments as um, external signs of outward and inward grace. But look at what the grace does. It's to strengthen and quicken faith. The sacraments themselves are in no way efficacious for salvation. That salvation is rooted in the work of Jesus Christ alone. So there's a story here then of how sacramental theology in Anglicanism develops historically. Uh, that's something we can uh, discuss further, and that is also what's uh, reinforced in other pieces of the seminary curriculum. I want to highlight what Article 34 says. I want to read this piece from our book, Confessions and Catechisms of the Reformation by Mark Knoll. Article 34 is on the traditions of the church. It says this, It's not necessary that traditions and ceremonies be in all places one or utterly alike, for all times they've been diverse and may be changed according to the diversity of countries, times, and men's manners, so that nothing is ordained against God's word. This is an important uh, statement within the context of the Protestant project in England, because what we have, as I've been alluding to, is different people returning from exile in Europe with different ideas about how Protestant the Church of England should be. And some say, well, it's done this way in Germany, it's done this way in Geneva, it's done this way in Strasbourg. And this article wants to say, oh no, the way in which church happens, these various rites and ceremonies, can happen in diverse ways so long as there's nothing in them ordained against God's word. Moreover, it says, whosoever through his private judgment willingly and purposely does openly break the traditions and sermons of the church which are not repugnant to the word of God and are ordained and approved by common authority ought to be rebuked openly as he offends against the common order of the church, hurts the authority of the magistrate, and wounds the conscience of the weak brethren. That is to say, in England, we're going to do it this way. We're going to have surpluses over our cassocks. Even if you think that reminds you of a Catholic theology of the Eucharist, we don't hold that that's what that symbolizes, but the wearing of cassock and surplus is just for good order. And so there's nothing here that should offend you. And if you speak out against the wearing of, say, surpluses, you offend the good order of the church, you offend the authority of the magistrate or Queen Elizabeth, and you trouble the conscience of other Christians, the weaker brethren. This notion of it's appropriate for various countries to have various forms of church order, as long as they all adhere to scripture, is going to be a fundamental piece of Anglican ecclesiology or an Anglican theology of the church. What this is going to mean down the road is as Anglicanism develops into a global tradition, it can then deem it appropriate for different countries to contextualize their worship and ceremonies in different ways as long as they cohere with the word of God and set forth good order. So this is what's going to allow us to have contextualized worship in different parts of Anglicanism. And this is something we'll be, again, talking about in more detail as the semester goes on. So a lot of scholars want to look to about a five to ten year period of time when Elizabeth first comes to a throne as saying, okay, this Elizabeth sets the house in order, and then we can just go on from there and pretend that the whole question of the Protestant identity of the Church of England is settled. However, um, that's not really true. People talk about Elizabeth establishing a via media 
or some kind of middle way between Protestantism and Catholicism. This is very common and popular uh, descriptions of the Episcopal Church or of the Anglican tradition in general. Um, there's just no evidence for this. There's no evidence Elizabeth is trying to create a middle way between Protestantism and Catholicism. That is a 19th and 20th century reading of what's happening here that is being done for 19th and 20th century purposes and not for 16th century realities. Rather, the so-called Elizabethan settlement is simply put, just a restoration of Edwardian Protestantism. That is, it is setting the clock back to 1553. And then the only settlement that happens here is Elizabeth says, I like to stop the clock here. This is as far as reform is going. Now, many people in the Church of England have assumed that there would be an incremental form of uh, progressive Protestantization of the Church of England so that eventually England would come to look like Geneva or Strasbourg, these really reformed centers. And Elizabeth simply has no interest. She says, I like the church in 1553. I think pushing the church past that benchmark of 1553 when um, Edward dies um, is itself divisive. This leads to a lot of tension for the Church of England for the next 30 years. And it also leads to lots of local experimentations of, well, how far can we push the boundaries of the established order to see if around the edges, if we can tinker within these rules to make this a church more appealing to those who want it to be more reformed in its nature. So what we have throughout the 1560s then is a struggle between um, parishes and um, the officials of the queen over, can we remove these images from our church? Can we tear down the root screen? Can we get rid of this altar and have a table in its place? By the end of the 1560s, um, pressure from bishops um, leads to the removal of images and altars. Um, and the table then emerges as a symbol of reform. But we have lots of parishes that still do not have uh, strong reformed preaching. They don't have... Um, all the service books they need. They don't even have bishops uh, or rather Bibles in, in uh, English and very few uh, resident ministers. Um, so what we have is a reformed looking church. There's no images up of saints and Mary. Um, the tables there instead of the altar, and so there is a reformed style of the celebration of the Lord's Supper, but all of the other infrastructure to make it reformed still needs to be filled in over the next few decades. All the while, in parallel, we have this Catholic population, and um, there is significant Catholic resistance within local population about the change back to reformed Protestantism. Most people end up conforming. Those who can um, afford to not conform, often nobility, come to be known as recusants. That is, they recuse themselves from obeying the statutes of the Church of England. Um, this all leads, in the year 1570, to Pope Pius V excommunicating Elizabeth I in a papal bull, Regnans and Excelsis in which he permits rebellion by local Catholic lords against Elizabeth. The logic here is whichever Catholic lord overthrows Elizabeth, that person has the right to claim the throne of England for the uh, Catholic Church. This sets off widespread Protestant hysteria about an internal threat to England. And so there's a claim then made that these recusants are traitors who obey the Pope instead of the Protestant Queen. And so this leads to a real crackdown on the presence of Catholics in England. 
and a uh, further burrowing of English Catholicism into an underground church movement and essentially a domestic religion, a household religion. Um, it continues to exist in England um, until it becomes legal again in the early 19th century. But there are strains now throughout England around religious identity by 1570 between wings of Protestantism, this, um, uh, the, the fear of the power of the Catholic Church, and Elizabeth over all of it trying to hold the pieces together. So the notion of an Elizabethan settlement might be misplaced because the question is, what does she actually settle if we have all these debates? So we're going to explore this debate uh, among Protestants in more detail in our next video.